All right, guys, so here's the game board. I got it set up right here. Um, here's the trail area. And before I get into it, I'm going to explain, show you something that I personally use. If you're like me and you're old school and you like to use um, pencil and paper still to uh, track your progress, I really suggest picking these up. These are excellent. I'm going to show you why. It's called the Ampad Gold Fiber Writing Pad. And they can be a little bit pricey, but if you use them for what I use them for, you'll get a lot of use out of this book. And that is the fact that you have an area for a ledger and you can turn it over in the back and it's graph paper. So you can lay out your map and throw that in with your notes. I like to keep everything very simple. I don't like to get overly elaborate with stuff. And one of the most efficient ways I've found to keep track of my progress when creating maps um, is to use this it's really simple uh, system that you can make cool looking little maps very quickly. And with this storyline, I decided it's time to put a map down. It's time to start opening this area up because the story is progressing at this point. So down here is where my RP originally started in this village and they had progressed up the old forest road here. This is where the Goblin Trail path has led up to the area where the end boss is. If you remember, I introduced him. He was the Goblin Chieftain. That was just a real crude, miserable jackass that just loves to torture and torment his own troops below him, but is just ruthless. And over here, I decided to add on this area is going to be a large, rocky valley. And this is going to eventually um, dump out to this mountain range here, which is a that's a whole entire ball of wax later on down the road. Um, currently, right here, number six is where my characters are um, going to uh, take place with this session. And you can see I got this laid out um, on my terrain right here. As you can see, I have two different lengths of the trail. One here, where they will be coming in at. And, of course, same as last battle map. Each one of these markers represents a different area for a potential encounter. But the main focus is going to be this area right here. And that area is a whole entirely new undiscovered piece leading out into here, which I marked down on the map. And that area is going to be a small rocky valley. And hopefully my characters can find a safe area to hide out and lay low for a while because they got some things to take care of. And the way I want to take my story and progress it is I want to try to see if I can actually save this sorcerer. Can I save the sorcerer? I know this game is a meat grinder. It's meant to cycle through characters quickly and kill them in the horrible, in um, just very dark ways. Or, or can I save him? Well, I guess it all boils down to this. It just depends on how you want to run the game for yourself because this game will give you the freedom to be able to do that because it is such a simple, quick referenced playing game. So let's jump into the scenario. Let's um, get to it. So first thing first, I'm going to do is I'm just going to put that out, that we have already been through this area. I'm going to move the camera over this way so you can get a better view of it. And that is we've already been through these areas. We've already gone through them. And the odds of those being reoccupied at this point are going to be very low. 
So I'm going to set the percentage rating for an encounter um, at about 25%. Anything below uh, 25% is going to um, produce an encounter. Anything above is not. Now, if you notice, I am using an old school um, percentage system here that works very well. I love it. I love it for everything. And the way I like to use the percentage system with more Borg is to answer them questions is look at first the probability. When I went originally went through, I rolled is was there a possibility for an encounter on any of these markers? And it was the level of probability. So 50% being a non-known, could or couldn't be, where anything above 50% is a higher probability. So higher the probability number, the more likely there would be an encounter. And the lower, well, the less likely there is to be an encounter. But this, I want to use to per, I want to use my percentage chance, and I want to add in the fact that we've already been through here. We've already fought all the goblins in this area and did killed them. What, what is the likelihood that they're going to repopulate these areas in the short amount of time of our absence as we're coming back through? So that's where I'm going at that. Just explaining, this is a, you could call it a fate roll if you wanted to, if you want to look at it that way. That's how I'm going to run this. And like I said, anything below 25%, well, there will be an encounter and that will have to be dealt with. So the characters enter into the area and I'm going to be using a lot of my abilities to answer a lot of the variables here that we're going to have questions for. And my first character to come in is going to be Lion Court. He will be here at the first area that possibly be an encounter he's helping carry the sorcerer i'm gonna actually um you know what i'm gonna do in this absence i'm gonna put a marker die out and i love to use dice for this dice work excellent i will i have different sets of dice in different colors just for this so you can have a a marker point if you will um Ways to put markers on the game board that looks not only more uh, uniformed, but at the same time is easily recognizable and you can get a decent amount of them to be able to represent those. So I like using these guys for this. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to put a blue D6 cider. This is going to represent my incapacitated sorcerer. I want to put him right here. Currently, he's leading the way. He's carrying the sorcerer, I'll say, um, and trying to get everybody out of the area and basically retreat and get out of, out of town before, you know, <laughs> they get killed. Now... The other character that I'm going to put trailing behind, of course, is going to be Elena de Rue, which is the newly acquired cleric into the party. And so she may have the feet of the sorcerer carrying them, and they're just trying to hustle out of the area. All right, so let's get some questions answered here. Let's get dice out here and let's get, oh, oh boy. Sorry about that. I had a goblin miniature underneath here. I was worried about uh, crushing with my dice tray and not paying attention. I knocked into the camera, okay. Which I'm still going to have to move that over a little bit. Actually, move that right there. And we'll just do one of these. Okay. 
First things first, so let's get them percentage die. They come to the first area. They are heading away. They have the sorcerer in hand. And they come to the first marker area. 25% or less, there will be an encounter. So let's see. 29%. Ooh, that was very close. Very, very close. So let's move the minis up to the next marker of their travel. And we will repeat that again. <laughs> A zero six percent. So this area has been repopulated. Um, oh boy. <laughs> this may be, um, a very, very quick game here. But, nevertheless, I'm going to need them percentile dice again. Let's figure out what kind of goblin we're dealing with. I'm going to roll on my percentage dice because I have four different encounters. And we'll see which one we're dealing with here. Okay, that would be a 62%. And that's on my chart going to put me into goblin archers. Okay. So, there's a possibility of uh, 1d4 goblin archers. So, let's roll a 1d4. Let's see how many archers there are there currently. One. So, there's one archer, a scraggler that's hanging around out here. And he will be right here currently. All right. Let's jump on back to the DM screen. Let's get this stuff uh, rolling out and see who's going to go first, how they're going to react, and hopefully the characters come out on top and the Goblin Archer uh, faces a very short but and uh, death, right? <clears throat> but in Mork Borg, I've learned things don't always go exactly the way you want them to okay so first things first let's see who goes first and let's get that out of the way this is going to give us the battle i hope goes quickly and is over quickly okay number two so that's going to be the enemies okay so the goblin archer gets the drop on them here and he sees the characters struggling down the trail carrying the sorcerer and is able to line up a shot pull his bow back and get a really good bead on my mercenary here ligon court right here so this is really gonna stink but let's take a look at the defense rating of Ligon Court, and he is at a 15. So he's going to have to have a 15 or better to be able to hit. Okay, so he's rolled a 6. Um, that's not going to do it. So now my character's turn, and let's... So as they're coming up the trail, they... Ligon hears an arrow, whew, boom, right into the ground. Um, this is the first question I want to answer. And I'm going to use his um, ability score. And with Ligon Court, first thing I'm going to do is use his presence. He's got a plus two. I'm going to say difficulty rating um, is going to be a 14 that he actually sees where the arrow came from. Because if you remember, this is an encounter. He's, an, he's a scraggler. He's been in hiding. He's found a dark shadow to hide into and be able to throw an arrow to see if he can take him out. Okay, roll the 15. He does. So Ligon Court, uh, he sees the arrow. He quickly follows by looking at it, the tra trajectory arc, if you would, and... He is able to see the goblin there pulling another arrow out, getting ready to knock it. So now, 
Ooh, what do we do? Well, we're going to have to divide this one to conquer. So I think what I'm going to have Ligon Court do is he's going to look over his shoulder at Elena and say, here, drag him, you know, don't let him get killed. I got to go. And uh, lays the sorcerer down draws a sword and begins his movement towards the goblin and that's gonna pretty much end his turn for his actions what he can actually do now with elena i'm gonna say it is um obvious but i gotta we gotta figure out something about elena now she's gonna have to drag the sorcerer and i'm going to roll against uh her strength an average roll which is going to be a difficulty class of 12 she's got a plus one to strength let's see if she can drag the sorcerer off by herself or she's gonna have to figure something else out why um lagging goes in to slay this archer okay number four no she's struggling um the walk and carrying the sorcerer has just taxed both of them, and they're just... Uh, so, let me see what I can do here. Hmm. Well, I don't really have a shield, anything like that. But the only thing she's really going to be able to do is stand guard over the sorcerer and hope that this battle is over quickly. And that will take care of that round currently. I'll just move her over here off the board like so. She's just standing guard over. And let's roll a d6 again. Let's see who will be the next one to go first in the round number five that'll be the pcs it's good it's in my favor so a lagging court comes basically running charging at this goblin draws as he's running towards him draws his two-handed sword out <laughs> and is dead set on trampling and killing this goblin archer so Let's see how that goes. We'll roll a 20-sider. Now, my strength bonus is a plus 3. And let's see if we can add that plus 3. The defense rating of the goblin is a 14. So I rolled a 17. The defense rating of the goblin is a 14. That's more than enough to hit the goblin. Now, let's go to resolve damage. Now, the average goblin has... A total HP of six. And this is really, really good. Even if you look at um, a really cool book I want to play around with, and I'm not trying to get off the beaten track of the RPG, it's called Savage, Savage Species. And it's from 3rd Edition D&D. Excellent source book. It explains to you how to source, how to basically spec out a... Um, monster that you, into a playable character level advancement and stuff like that so i even looking at this game and the way that this game flows especially with the encounters like this some of these smaller um encounters that you have you could take that and spin that you could make a whole entire adventure based off an idea of a goblin archer and the struggles uh, they were dealing with prior to your characters coming into the mix. Just saying, it's a cool idea for solo RPG that um, I like to mess around with at times. So let's say this encounter goes south and the goblin survives and gets away. You see what I mean? I could take this story into a different direction if I wanted to. So food for thought. Anyways, let's get back to the damage on this goblin. Let's roll the 1d10 plus 3. Oh, right out of the dice tray. 
Okay, that's an 8, 9, 10. Um, yeah, he just comes running up onto this goblin, and before he can get his arrow knocked, he looks up and just in sheer terror as he sees the blade coming down. Oh, the end of that archer. All right, so the area is clear. Now, I can, uh, I've, I've attacked. That's pretty much going to be my action this turn. Um, now, she's still standing guard over the sorcerer. And I'm going to have Ligon just do a quick search of the corpse and i'm going to go to the main court rule book and this is the uh corpse plundering page and let's see what we find all right so it's a d66 system i'm gonna use these two dice right here which this will be my tens and this will be my ones and let's see what we get. 61%. All right. So 61 through 66, the result is silver. All right. So we found some silver. Let's see how much silver we found on this guy. I'm going to roll the 2d6 again. Oh. Into the dice tray. 10. Okay. So we find, uh, Ligon finds 10 silver. Now, the one unique thing about this game, um, or I should say how I like to handle riches, currency, treasure, how whatever you want to refer to it, is I like it to be very limiting in my games. I don't like my games to be revolved around just um, gold, silver, treasure like that. And the reason why I say that is... Um, that aspect is cool for the fact that you gain treasure and you got a system where you're constantly spending it so you're constantly adjusting your value um yeah those are okay but i like to have a world set up to where it's more rare so when you do find it you're like cool and by doing that um you can really focus more so on other aspects of the game that you may want to take it to. So you could do just all treasure, right? And up and down, you find a lot of treasure, you spend a lot of money to purchase or upgrade this. You, you find a lot of silver, you spend a lot of money to get a new enchantment on your armor. You can do them games this way. Those games are... I played them like that. It's a cool aspect to play them. But I like to open it up a little bit more. I want to have more flexibility to create, expand out, but I want to do it quickly. I don't want it to be so overly emphasized and so meticulously cataloged to the point that um, it takes away from the map area itself you fill out the map quicker so each area basically having one um focal point one encounter in it and the next area over here having the same thing on the map if that makes sense to you um it's just a quicker way to play them it, you can look at it um if you'd like, some people enjoy hex crawls. I guess you could say it's kind of like a mashup between a hex crawl type of structure and a little bit um, board gaming, if you will, influence there too. Some of the mechanics that I liked. And I really enjoy to use that with my RPG for the fact that it helps move things along quicker. It helps the storyline move quicker. And you can really... Um, get through pre-published modules that way because they move at the same pace so you anyways i'll talk about more i'll talk about those more later 
and how to take a published um, adventure module and go through it and how to really make it a very fun experience that is uniquely your own and not just taking it for, you know, every word printed as is literally. Okay. All right. So got that out of the way. Boom. He's found and increased his silver. He returns. Um, they pick up the sorcerer and they head to the next area. Okay. Same thing again. We're going to use the percentile dice. I want to see where we fall. Is there an encounter here? 25% or less is an encounter. 62%. No, no, there is no encounter there. We are going to move on and boom. At this point, I want to do something radically different. I want to see since this has all began and the way that the the weather has been going, this horrible storm is rolling in, you know, lightning streaking down, just like real violent, wicked stuff. Has the weather changed? That's what I want to see. That's what I want to see. Has the weather changed? So I'm going to go back to my percentile dice. I'm going to go back to the percentile roll. Um, 50% being the center and then the probabilities go from there, right? So higher the number, higher the probability. Lower the number, lower the probability. 55%. Whew. So that is the unknown. And what do we do with that question? The unknown. What do we do with the unknown? Damn. Well, I'll show you what we can do. Why don't we go get ourselves an oracle? And that's how I like to use these oracles, generating questions. And this is from a, a completely different book altogether, uh, Scarlet Heroes. It's one of my favorite um, solo emulators that I like to use. And it's I'll show you why here. So I'm going to go to the emulator chart right here. And let's just look this up. So the, what is the likelihood of the question we are asking? Well, it's the unknown. It's center, right? 55%. It, it could go either way. So yes or no. Uh, you roll a 1d20. Let's see what the result is. Let's see what the result is. An 18. So I've rolled an 18. Let's go back to the chart. Let's take a look. Okay, unknown, 18, 16 to 20. Yes. So the weather has changed. The weather is beginning to go through a change. It is, uh, it's either going to get worse or it's going to get better. And we don't know what it's going to do. So I got to roll a 1d12. And... See what's going on with this. Number eight. Ooh. Okay, so the, the weather has changed from lightning streaking down, the winds blowing, and finally it's changed over to rain, and it's the worst is over. Things are starting to calm a little bit. And there is this soup thick mist that's just coming down so it's beginning to get dark and it's beginning to get darker outside because we're getting into now late afternoon or early evening and we were already in the shadow of this forest right here with this tree cover but now it's getting very dark and it's getting harder to see and we have like the soup like mist coming down which begs the question, I've gotten to this area of the trail. I wanted to open this up more and I wanted to extend the map out, see what's over here, see if they can find cover. And well, how I'm going to 
resolve that is Ligon is, he's carrying the sorcerer, right? He's, let's just say he's got him, um, the bulk of him, maybe up on his shoulder. And she's helping with the legs, support the back half. So they kind of split the load a little bit, if you will, to um, be able to reserve their strength if they run into another large encounter. So I want to see if he knows this is here, if he recognizes this. And we got to add some different elements of complexity to this because the weather has changed. We are currently now in this area with this thick, heavy mist coming down. It has gotten dark. We got cloud cover, which is only making it darker because you're not going to have the light of the moon. And every so often we just see a strobing in the clouds from distant thunder coming down. And we are in a rocky, outcropping, rolly hill type of area. When he gets to this area, is he able to navigate and remember the area he came in through during the day? Or is he going to deviate off the path? Is he going to lead them into another area? That question is unknown. And, well... I'm going to leave that up to an ability roll. So my presence, I get a plus two to that ability. When he comes to this area, does he remember what it looks like in the evening um, compared to when he went through the day? Comparing he's never been here before. So let's say that's going to be a 14. That's going to be the challenge rating of this. I get a plus two to it. A six. No, that's not going to be enough. So as he's coming through this area, he's squinting from the, the mist coming down, trying to shake the uh, rain that's just sticking to everybody. And almost like, I imagine it like almost as a heavy, wet snow. I just went through that here in Michigan. We just had a snowstorm come through. And you just have this heavy mist coming down. It's just borderline freezing, collecting to you. And you're just having to constantly bang the droplets of water off your hood so you can actually see where you're going and then the result of this is he's lost his way he begins to move down this rocky small rocky valley but this is good because they're looking for an area to uh, basically hunker down to be able to allow the cleric to do the work it needs to do to bring the sorcerer back, right? That's what we're we're going after. That's how I expanded my map out, and that's how I'm going to take my story to this area. Okay, so first things first, let's figure out some parameters of this encounter, or this area, I should say, that if you remember, marked on the map, which is located right here. This little, if you look right here, here are the mountains. And I got some hills right here. I put in some small mountains with the rocky type of hills. So a very, uh, a valley, if you will, a valleyed area that could offer them some protection. So let's see. Let's go to the probability table. Let's see what the probability of an encounter being there. 81%. So there is some resistance there. And let's see what we're dealing with here. Okay, so I rolled a 32. 32 on my chart of my encounters is the Goblin Idiot. <laughs> so... Oh, man. And these things travel in packs, which makes them even more dangerous. So there's a possibility of 1d8 of these things being there. Wow. Kind of not what I want to deal with right now. But let's see. One. Okay. There's a scraggler. Cool, 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 cool. And let's set this 
set this area up a little bit. We'll get rid of the trail. I want to do a more rocky type of area that's going to reflect a rocky area. All right. So we'll push these trees out a little bit. We're getting away from the forest and <clears throat> we are currently entering an area like this. And put a couple of these guys on there just to really uh, fill it out. Okay, so when we come into this area, we're only going to have two options to go around this. So we're going to come in here, which is going to be your, right here is going to be your pinch point. That's where I would imagine an encounter being, but far be it from me to leave it to that. Let's leave it to chance. Let's see what the dice say. So, is the encounter here, or is the encounter on one side of this rocky outcropping leading into the valley? Let's just see. Let's, uh, let's roll a percentile dice. Let's answer that question. So let's go on the probability that that encounter is there. 22%, it's not. So... Let's roll, because so we know it's not there. It's going to be up here by this rocky outcropping. So I can reduce this down to a D6. So saying on a 1D2, so a roll of 1 through 3 would count as 1. A roll from 4 to 6 would count as 2. We will figure out where the encounter actually is. On a 1D2, rolling a 1 would mean it's here. Rolling a two would place it here. All right. A five. Okay, so our goblin idiot is right over here. Let me say, hanging out at this rocky outcropping area. Now, I have to see which area my characters entered into this area. I'm going to let that resolve that down to a 1d2. So let's roll that and see what we get. A 4. So it just so happens the characters enter into this area right here where this goblin is currently at. And once again... Um, we're going to have to see who goes first and what happens here. So I'm going to roll a 1d6. And on the... I'll leave it open like... There we go. So on the uh, chart here, on the Game Master, it says we got a d6. Who goes first? Let's resolve that. And let's see. I rolled a 5. So the PCs, thank God, get to go first again this time. Once again, lying courts in the front. As he comes around this rocky outcropping, um, there is a goblin standing there. So I want to take this a little, I want a little bit more information. Goblin is standing there. I want to go to the reaction chart and I want to see what is the goblin currently doing. He's observing this goblin before it can observe him. And I like to leave this up to the reaction chart and number five so he looks very angered and um he looks like he's he has been tortured or 
very nervous about something, but he doesn't know what. So there's a possibility they encountered something else out here in the rocky outcropping, and he's the one that got away, heading back towards the Kamala tribe, and now he's going to run into us. Okay, so with that, um, for my turn, I am going to set the sorcerer down, draw my sword, and get ready for battle. Same thing I did last time. I have Elena here. I want to see if Elena could pass her save this time to be able to scoop the sorcerer up and um, be able to get out of the way. So we're going to leave that to a strength test. And her strength, she has a plus one bonus to it. Uh, the challenge rating is going to be a 12, which is just going to be a normal... Okay, she rolled a 12 plus 1, 13. So this time she has no problem. She's able to get the uh, sorcerer up on her shoulder and clear back away from this battle that's getting ready to ensue. Okay, goblin's turn. So the goblin is already, he's angered by something. And he has now noticed he has an invader into his area. Let's see how, I'm gonna roll on that goblin reaction roll again. I wanna see how he's going to react to this. So let's roll our 2d6. So the goblin is just in shock. It's like, it doesn't know what to think. It thought it was alone. Now it sees this um, very pissed off mercenary heading towards it with <laughs> a very lethal weapon to come and end you. And he just does not know how to react to it. He's just like in one of those moments of like, fuck. <laughs> so, all right. <clears throat> but... Nevertheless, he does get a uh, opportunity to react to this. And, well, let's see how well the goblin does. So the goblin idiot is pretty straightforward. He doesn't get any bonuses, nothing for any of his attack rolls. So let's see what he rolls. The defense rating for... Um, lagging court is a 15. So he's going to have to roll a 15 or better. Rolls a 4. So he doesn't... Yeah. He goes after him, maybe out of a response of fight or flight to be able to um, preserve himself, but, well, doesn't work too well. He finds out quite quickly um, his opponent's a lot larger than him and is trampled. <laughs> so... Um, yeah, at that, let's go back to the D6. Let's start the round over again and see who gets the next, um, lead in the initiative, order, if you will. Number three, it's going to be the enemies. So, um, with the goblin being able to see this, uh, mercenary coming in and just, just more or less shoulders them and uh i'm gonna roll and see if he does a save if he does a dexterity save if he does i'm gonna give him an ability to be able to regain his footing if you will and uh let's see this this will be interesting so for the goblin i'm gonna say it's a small creature up against this guy yeah it's double his size um so i'm gonna say it's gonna be a 16 so his difficulty rating will be a 16 to pull this off let's see he rolls a five he's unable to so the goblin is going to spend its first round at that point standing itself back up because he's as he came went to go try to attack he just grossly missed. I mean, it was horrible. He's got this guy just charging at him. He goes after him to try to attack him. He was just, boom, knocked over. 
and he's going to have to regain his footing and re-engage into the area of combat. Okay, that resolves that. Now, goes to Lagan Court. It is now his turn. He is... He has elbowed into the goblin. He has a sword drawn. Is he going to be able to pull this off? Well, this is how I'm going to resolve this. So, this time, instead of using my strength modifier to my attack roll, um, I'm going to use my agility, which is a plus two. So, it's going to be one less, but this should be an agility attack not so much as just a brute strength attack where the opponent's right there directly in front of him. Now he's doing a little bit more. He's elbowed him. He's got a sword drawn. Can he come through with and land an attack to be able to really do some devastation? Let's find that out. Let's find that out. I get a plus two to this roll. A two. No. So he's able to successfully shoulder him. He's got a sword but the goblin was knocked far too back onto his ass as they seen him jump to his feet and he's going to have to prepare for the next attack. So the goblin is preoccupied. He is completely preoccupied with what he has going on here. I don't even think um, the sorcerer and my cleric over here are even in consideration at this point. Let's go straight into the goblin. The goblin has his footing. He's got to have hit a defense rating 15 or better to be able to do any damage. Let's see what he does. He rolls a 6. No, he is incapable. Leg in court. Um, now, I'm going to do a normal attack like normally I would do it. I rolled a 19. I don't even need my bonuses. I have a feeling this guy is just going to be executed. <laughs> So rolling a 1d10 plus 3 for my damage, I got an 8, 9, 10, 8. I mean, they got 6 hit points of health. He was just boom, annihilated. Alright, let's jump on back to the corpse plundering, right? Lagan Court's going to look over the corpse. He's going to see what he can find. And I got to roll a d66. So I get a 13, 11 through 16, the remains of something worthless crumbles in your hands. Okay, so not only was this a, uh, just your typical goblin idiot, it was a broke goblin idiot at the same time. So nothing there. Okay, so there was one encounter into this area. We determined it started here. This is where my characters came in. Um... Let's see if there's any other things into this area. I determined there was an encounter in this area, but let's leave it up and let's see what we can do. I'm going to have Lagan Court look around. I'm going to have him search these areas. Each area will be something different. We'll see what it offers. And open the map area a little bit more. So first things first, he she's a sword walks over to this crappie area, rock outcropping area, um, is looking around the best he can to see what he can see. Now, we got to remember, there's a heavy misting rain that's occurring. It's coming down at a pretty good clip, and that's also making things difficult to see. But, first and foremost... I'm, I want to see here um, what we're going to be dealing with. Is this going to be a trap? Is this going to be maybe a, we'll say, environmental counter, right? Like a rock slide, something like that. Or could it be something such as treasure? We don't know. We don't know. So, this is how I'm going to settle this. I say we'll roll the um, percentile dice, and the higher the probability, 
the more so there is um, something there in a the way of a trap or an environmental hazard. And let me see what we actually do find there. And, okay, so I'm going to say for an environmental hazard, it's going to be, I'm going to say 50% or less. If it's a trap, it's going to be 50% or higher. So let's see where our probability falls. 10. So... 110 plus 10, that would be 100%. Um, well, there is a trap. There's something that's trapped there. Hmm. <laughs> well, I have the perfect book for this. And let's see what we can dig up. Okay, that book is right here, Tanks Treasury of Traps. This is an awesome supplement book. I love this. This is just loaded full of really, really cool ideas for different traps. Stuff that's so diabolical that you just you wouldn't normally think about, but it does offer um, very cool, I'll say, situations you have to deal with. Okay, so what kind of trap are we working with anyways? Hmm, so we got corridor traps, invisible walls, help I can't breathe, like a rat in a cage, fell to an illusion, rolling down the hallway, flipping spikes, pits and pancakes, a watery sleep, acid falls, a whole, yeah, th this book has a lot into it. So. I like to look up the name of the trap and then take a look at what there is to offer. Now, for whatever reason, it makes me think rolling down the hallway, which makes sense to me because we're in this crappy, rocky valley area, and it kind of resembles a hallway here. I say we go to that trap and see what it has to offer. I'm going to probably have to make some alterations for this person, this scenario, but yeah, we'll see what we have to deal with. So rolling down the hallway, greased ball bearings make for slippery footing in a dangerous situation near an acid filled pit trap. Wow. Detailed description. While walking down the corridor, it is obvious that there is a pit trap up ahead. Even from a distance, it looks like a trap was previously tripped, as the five-foot-wide hallway spanning the hole is completely invisible. What is not so obvious is the pressure plate on the floor that activates the real trap. If the pressure plate is activated, a panel will slide into place and block the passage behind the adventurers. Simultaneously, thousands of greased ball bearings will drop into the hallway obscuring the party's vision while failing, while falling. While dealing with this barrage of ball bearings, the players will likely miss the falling of greased ball bearings on the other side of the pit. The ball bearings are treacherous and make walking risky. The only way to travel at this point is forward as the panel blocking the hallway, the way it's blocking the hallway the way back. A peek into the pit reveals seething, bubbling acid releasing a foggy cloud of gas from the ball bearings that it fell into, obscuring the far side of the pit, but it is only five feet across, an easy jump, and everything looked clear before a party member triggered the trap. But that was before the far floor became covered with its own set of greased ball bearings. Okay, so... <laughs> Um, identifying the trap. The trip plate is on an area on the ceiling 
and can be identified with a DC-16. Okay, so we're going to have to change things up for it to fit into this area, but that's not a problem. It really isn't. So I could say as he's searching this area, if he is very close, he's going to notice that there, um, there, there have been areas that have been rigged and he's kind of like that area that doesn't look right. And then realizes he sees the spring board trap lined up on some rocks. And if he steps on that pressure trap, boom, it will trigger. So, well, he has a presence of plus two. Let's see if he can pull this off. I'm going to say the difficulty class of this is going to be 14. Even though, let's see what they recommend in here. A DC 16. Okay, so we'll go with a 16. Let's see if he recognizes that or not. A 12, 13, 14. He does not. Unfortunately, as he's walking up this way, he's looking around. Um, he steps on the, the spring-loaded spring load, whatever you want to call it, trap mechanism. I don't, I don't, I don't care. Um, it triggers the trap. At this point, I'm going to move them in here. I'm going to say they hear the sound of sliding stones, heavy boulders hitting the floor. And that's where this area is going to change. Okay. So quickly, these areas right here become blocked off. The pathway back is not available because it is now filled in with large uh, boulders and stones blocking your way. So at that point, this rocky outcropping begins to shake and large rocks begin to roll down and fall into the surrounding areas until this whole area is washed out this way, washing it down with, you guessed it, greased ball bearings that are coming from what appeared to be manufactured sh shoots inside this rocky outcropping. Indicating that there could be more than meets the eye here. Hmm. So, first things first. Let's see if uh, she's going to be affected first. And then I got to answer a question about the sorcerer. And I'll get to that here in a minute. Elena DeRue. Um, so, the ball bearings start flooding out into this area. She's trying to keep the sorcerer protected but she sees the area caving in around here and of course she's going to begin to move away from the area of the crumbling rocks and i want to roll a dexterity roll i want to see if she's able to outmaneuver the greased rolling ball bearings that are starting to flood into this area so Let's do a an agility save. She gets a plus two from her ability, and she rolls an 11, 12, 13. Okay, so we're going to keep the, the difficulty rating is 12. That's the basic um, midline average rating. She got a 13, so she's able to hoof it and move ahead of the greased ball bearings a little bit. Um, Court, I'm going to see if he's able to lag in court. See if he passes his agility save or if he falls. Let's see. Okay, he's rolled a two. He's got a plus two. He has failed miserably. 
he has fallen on his ass, plow, like that, from the grease ball bearings, and now there's going to be He's going to have a hell of a time getting up on grease ball bearings. Yeah. So he has failed that. I'm going to say he has currently moved five feet down this way because everything's leading down this way into the valley. The grease ball bearings are coming out from this area. She has found some footing. She's on her feet at this point trying to outrun as these ball bearings are coming down this way. As you can see, let me just move the camera. There we go. So the grease ball bearings are moving down this way. Okay. Whew. Now, I am going to roll. Um, I'm going to have her move. She can only move a quarter of her speed. She's carrying the sorcerer. Her average movement would be 30 feet. So half would be 15. To move that down to a quarter, I'd say a 12. So we'll reduce that to... 10. She can move 10 feet. So we'll say 5, 10. So she's able to make it here. Now I'm going to have her roll another dexterity save to see if she is still ahead of the greased ball bearings or if the greased ball bearings have finally caught up with her. 11. Their agility is two, that'd be 12, 13. So once again, she has um, managed to stay ahead of the grease ball bearings. <laughs> okay, so I'm gonna roll a dexterity save for um, Ligon Court. I'm gonna see if he is able to uh, get to his feet and try to outmaneuver the grease ball bearings. He's rolled a 10 plus 12. No, he's tried. He's slipping, and he's going to move another five feet down this area. Okay. Now, here is a marker area. I want to see um, if anything is triggered here. So as Elena heads through this way, she gets to a rocky outcropping wall. She's got the sorcerer on the shoulder. She's struggling to keep through. It's just, she has been, is pushed to her max. Stress, physical endurance, <laughs> the whole nine yards. So let's see what the probability of there being, um, a, another component of the trap there. A hundred percent. Okay, so as she's moving along here, she starts to hear the familiar sound of the of this area being inundated with more greased ball bearings that are dumping out into this area. This is horrible. This is horrible. Um, they may both be flushed right into a giant pit of acid. <laughs> Okay. Now, let's, um, <laughs> let, how do I want to, I'm going to roll an initiative roll for this. That's what I'm going to do. That's exactly what I'm going to do. So I'm going to say, um, I'm going to roll two D6. One for each of my characters adding their agility bonuses to it to see who goes first. So the cleric has a plus two, which is Elena. So four. She has a total of four. Lagging Court, he has a plus two to his agility. He rolls two, so bam. Okay. Well, it's the unknown, right? Broke even. Even Steven across the board. And I'm going to go back to... an oracle and see how I can well
how to answer this. Who goes first? Who's going to get that first saving throw? They both rolled at the same time. And I need a way to be able to resolve this. So let's ask the question. Let's go to the general oracle right here. The unknown. And we just got to start with one of them. And I'm going to ask the question, does Ligon Court, he's not carrying a sorcerer. He's just sliding down, a, you know, a hill, if you will, on greased ball bearings right now. Is he able to get to his feet and get his save before Elena, who's carrying the sorcerer, she has just made it to here to realize this area right here is beginning to flood this whole area out with more grease ball bearings. Or will it be him? Will it be him that goes first? That's the question I want to know. That's the unknown. I'm going to leave it to my oracle here to tell me. So does Lycan Court go first? It's, let's roll a d20. 16, so unknown, 16 through 20 right here is yes. Yes, he does. He does it. Okay, so let's do his save first. Let's get him out of the way. Ligon Court, his agility is a plus two. So he's going to need a 12 or better to be able to get to his feet. Oh, he rolls a five plus two. He doesn't make it. He just slides another five feet. And then I'm going to have to see what's awaiting these areas. Because there could be some bad things in this area awaiting my characters. Well, we know there's already, when we get into this area down here, a pit of acid. But what about these areas? We don't know yet. Because I've had to, I've adjusted this trap, well, to my game session. So I'm using the overall idea of the grease ball bearings, but I've changed things to adapt to this map. All right, so we're going to move that up there a little bit. And now I'm going to have to extend that map out. We got to open it up a little bit more. And we're going to need. A pit of acid, right? So, I'm going to pull out of my dungeon tiles here. I'm going to see if I can find something. I'm going to put this there, like so. It kind of... I like that. It kind of resembles almost you know, smoldering earth, if you will. say off into these areas over here they can see where the rocky outcropping areas just continue on once you get around the acid pit hmm boy that that, that sounds good so elena she gets to roll her agility save again to see if she's able to keep ahead of it or if she's well bound to the same fate let's see so she has a plus two to her agility she rolls a 16 just just amazing okay so five ten so she is able to be nimble on her feet she has successfully passed her save every time. And she's now trying to run after and save 
Ligand Court, who is quickly sliding down towards the acid pit. Oh, man. Okay. Well, let's see if... Let's see if Ligon can save himself again. First things first. Let's do an agility save. Come on, man. You can do it. You can do it. A three, four. Damn. So he has slid down into this area. Now, what is in this area? This is the unknown. We don't know. We don't know. We, we can see the acid pit here, but we don't know what's here. And we got to figure that out. So let's roll the percentile dice. Let's see where the uh, probability lies for an encounter. 86%. Okay, there are encounters here. What kind of encounters are there? That's what I have to know. So 0.8%. Oh, there are more goblin idiots in this area. So let's roll a 1d8 and let's see how many are actually going to be there. Three. There are three of these guys down there. Oh, man. So down here... In the recesses were the, I should say, high grounds. Laughing at Ligon Court as he is um, basically floating down this little valley floor on greased ball bearings quickly heading towards the acid pit where now some of the barbarian ball bearings that are you know obviously have beat Ligon to the acid pit he can now currently hear the sound of them um dissolving as they hit the acid pit and the chemical reaction between it the like that this is not good I don't like how this is going okay so there is an encounter here. He is rolling down the hill on ball bearings. Um, I don't know what more to say uh, about that. Um, first things first, let's do an agility save to see what he can do. Come on, come on. Ooh, finally, a 16 plus 2 is an 18. Ligon Court, uh, he, he makes a quick second decision. He sees the goblins up here laughing and mocking him as he's falling towards the acid pit, but then quickly realizes, wait a minute, they're not sliding on the ball bearings because they're on higher ground. He reaches his arm out and grabs the base of this higher grounded area pulling himself over and to his feet to avoid the ball bearings okay this is good he's not sliding towards the acid pit anymore now i gotta settle um my cleric and hopefully she does well again she gets a plus two a nine Oh, so her luck has ran out. Um, she feels her feet fall out from beneath her and finds herself planted right here on her ass, basically. We'll say face down, because that's the only way it's going to stay. And currently um begins to well i think she's over the shock of falling down the sorcerer has <clears throat> slammed right to the ground and i gotta settle him too because um i'm going to roll 
uh, a 1d6. And I'm going to use it as a d2. A 1 through 3 will mean he's the sorcerer is going to roll one area, one space. Um, a d2 spaces, or a d2, a 2 on 1d6, counting as a d2, he will move two spaces instead. So... This could be potentially bad. Let's see how this is going to go. Okay, so I'm going to roll that d6. It's a 6. He's going to... So, the sorcerer is unconscious now, has been flopped onto the ground. Um, He's circling, you know, the tunnel of light, basically, to the afterlife. And he's not putting up much resistance. He's just rolling on the greased ball, bar, ball bearings, probably face down. I wouldn't doubt it if he's not pointing completely down like an Olympic swimmer diving into an Olympic-sized swimming pool, but he's just nose down on a belly slide towards a pool of acid. So, one, two. Shit. All right. Let's uh, let's see who goes first on this round. Is it going to be the goblins or is it going to be um, Ligon? So let's get this resolved. Let's roll the 20 cider. Oh, sorry, wrong dice. Getting ahead of myself. Getting ready to go into the attack phase. I'm going to roll a d6. I'm going to roll a d6 and I'm going to check my chart over there. One through two, which is the enemies. The enemies get to go first. Oh, this sucks. So the goblins can see he's reached out. He's pulled himself up and he's beginning to climb the little incline here where they're hanging out. And the goblin idiots do not like that. So they are going to begin to attack him. He's got a dr 50 so they're going to have to roll a 15 or better. So the first attack is a 4. They missed. The second attack is a 19. Oh my god. <laughs> oh shit. Um, Alright, so they're doing 1d6 damage. three so his armor will do that by two and he will take one point of damage eh, it's not bad it's not bad not the end of the world here not good either twenty five now all right now it's Ligon's turn so he has taken a wound from one of these goblin idiots cracking upside the head with a club. But I'm going to, I'm up on this area. I'm going to roll, ooh, I want to roll an agility roll. I want to climb up here and see if I can grab one of these goblins and just toss them out into the grease ball bearings into the floor and let them slide into the pit of acid. So let's see how this works out. Ah, there's the 20 center. So I'm getting, I get a plus two to my agility. Their defense rating is a 14. So I am unable to achieve that. I begin climbing up the incline to go swing at the goblin and my footing slips and I got to reach out with both hands and catch myself again. Meanwhile, while that's going on, we have um, Elena over here. Let's see if she can roll her agility save to be able to catch herself or is the worst going to happen? Okay, a 9, 10, 11. No, no, she moves another 5 feet. And then I'm going to roll for him <laughs> a four. He's going to move another two feet. <laughs> Shit. The sorcerer is just quickly sliding down into the pit of acid. Okay. 
So let's get back to the D6. Um, let's see who goes first. A five, that will be the PCs. I don't think this is good for the Sorcerer, but it will be good for my PCs at least. So I'm going to try... I think at this point, I don't think there's really any way to save my Sorcerer. I'm, I'm looking at this. I have my Mercenary, um, who's finally on stable ground and under attack from goblins. Um, yeah. Oh, me. Oh, boy, oh, boy, oh, boy, oh, boy. Or could it? Could it? Could. Now that I think about it, it's a cleric. This, it has a, a connection to the divine, if you will, the basculus, right? And found in the main core rule book. We're almost there. There we go. The basculus. The basculus demands. There is a demand. But it is a favor from a divine source. Does it work? Can we pull this off? Well, here's a question. So... Can she throw out a prayer to the divine energies of this realm? Ask for a favor. Will they be granted? And what will have to be given up? But first thing is, first thing that has to be answered is, is her cry out for help. Is it heard from the deities. So this is going to be a monumental, even for a cleric with everything that's going on, this is going to be an 18. This is going to be very hard to achieve here. But if it does, this can work out very well um, to my benefit. Let's see. Let's just see. A 16. Um... Her presence is a 3, 17, it, she does. So, she cries out to the deity, and in a split second, she is mentally transported away into a, um, I'm going to say alternate dimension, where she comes walking out of the fog, and she is greeted with what looks like two um emerald piercing eyes that glow and followed by another set and these two sets of eyes begin to emerge from the darkness and in a very powerful voice asks what disturbs my slumber and Elena just explains the situation that's going on, explains how she has been so devout to the path of this deity that if a miracle could be thrown her way, she would fulfill any um, sacrifice that she would have to do to be able to get this, to be able to pay for this For this honor, if you will. And let's see how the gods are going to respond to this. Hmm. Hmm. How could I handle this? How could I handle this question? The gods have heard her cries. 
And will the gods do it? Or will the gods be cruel? That is the question. That's the unknown, right? And I want to know that. Instead of leaving... <laughs> I, I want to know the answer to that question. Instead of rolling it the way just for a story narrative, I could. But I want this an unknown. I want to know how the gods are going to answer her cries for help. So we're going to go back to the oracle here. I'm going to ask the question. Do the gods honor her request? 16. Whoa. Yes. Yes. No strings attached with this oracle. That's awesome. And we will see what they demand as a result. So the gods agree and says, oh, we can intervene. We can help uh, help turn this situation to your bidding, but at a price. There is a price that must be paid for such a demand from the gods to be able to alter the weaves of fate. That, that is a rare gift and that you have to pay for. So I'm going to roll on the Basculus Demands table, which is right here. And I'm going to pull and, and I'm going to interpret that to what the gods ask and demand. 18. Mm. Okay. So the gods demand, um, they want a pay, right? In order to save this life, they have to pay with another life. They have to have um, a spirit, uh, you know, so many spirits to be able to pay for, I guess, to save this one, to appease the weaves of fate. The gods grant the wish and say another life must fulfill the life of this one that is gained. One must take its place. So when she snaps back to her awareness as to what's going on, she feels this energy at that point fulfill her to the to where she's almost glowing in this magical aura. And she feels as if she has the dexterity and the speed of a god and is able to boom, leap towards the sorcerer before um, he is devoured into the acid pit. So, bam. She is able to catch him, and she notices the weird thing is the barbarians no longer have an effect on her footing, almost like if there is a, a radiant source of energy around her, that is emanating, shielding her from this. Okay, so. She is definitely, has got some divine presence going on here. Her God has heard her, answered her prayer. Unfortunately, she's going to have to find another life sacrifice to the God to save this sorcerer. So... From falling into um, <laughs> a pit of acid, he is still spiraling the drain. We still have to... I have saved his ass, if you will. The gods have willed this. They have decided to alter the weaves of fate because it was his fate to, at that point, exit this world on this day. But... To pay that forward someone else must take his place mm. 
Okay. Okay. I know how I'm going to do this. I am really, I know how I'm going to do this. The sorcerer, not the sorcerer, but, uh, she, I'm, she's able to pick the, uh, sorcerer up. Like I said, she almost feels like she has God's strength and she begins moving, um, towards this area where she can obviously see Ligon struggling with these goblins he's outnumbered he's trying to he's trying to fight a battle uphill literally and so she begins to move this way okay while that's going on that's the end of that round let's roll a d6 let's see who goes next is it the is it the goblins or is it the pcs wait a minute did i already Yes, that was the end of the turn, because she went, that was her last turn. Okay, so five, the PCs get to go first. So, Ligon Court is going to try this again. He's going to try to scale up the side of this embankment and start throwing some goblins over the side. Let's see if he does this. So, he's going to get a plus two... Um, I'm going to use this as an agility and get a plus two for his agility. I'm going to say the difficulty rating is 14. That's it, which will cover his defense rating as well, which is a 14. <sighs> no, he is unable. He tries scaling the wall once again and falls short trying to find his footing. <sighs> man, oh man. So, Elena has made it over here to where Court is. Ligon Court. And she, uh, she says, here, let me handle this. You take him. And basically passes the sorcerer off to him. And he's... He's going to have to support the sorcerer and hold his footing because he's still dealing with the grease ball bearings. He's on the side of the embankment, but now he's going to take on the weight of a sorcerer. He's going to be moving around on his feet. He's going to have to keep his footing, and hopefully he does not, um, you know, fall victim to greased ball bearings. Okay, so... He's got a strength um, bonus of plus three. He's going to have to have a 12 to be able to handle the, you know, slumping him up over the shoulder. And he gets a plus three to the roll. Let's see what he gets. 18. So he has no problems. He's able to shoulder the sorcerer. He's steadying himself, catching his breath, and trying to avoid the grease ball bearings that are rolling down this way and just bouncing right into the pit of acid and there's little wisps of smoke going from them being completely um dissolved okay now this will turn over to the goblin's turn so let's see who this goblin's going to engage with is he going to go after my mercenary easy pickings he's got a sorcerer on his back you know, this guy's been trying to attack him the last two rounds, or are they going to go after their new threat that uh, seems to have this unnatural human strength that's getting ready to scale the side of this embankment? So to settle that, I'm going to do the D6 thing again, right? A 1 through 3, or a D2, however you want to refer to this. A 1 through 3 will be Elena. A four through six will be lag in court. So I'm going to actually stand him up at this point. And boom. 
put the sorcerer token over there. Okay. Let's see who they go after. A one. Wow. Wow. So, yeah, they um, divert their attention towards El Elena getting ready to come up the side of the embankment. Okay. So, first attack from this one right here. She's got a defense rating of 14. Five is a miss. The second attack... A seven. Oh, she's lucky. Neither one was able to uh, deliver an adequate attack with their clubs to be able to even think about stopping there. So now let's get back to the D6. That's the end of everybody's turn and see who goes first this round. The enemies or the PCs. Six. The PCs do. Okay. Now I get to roll... And I'm going to lower the difficulty rating. It was a 14 uh, for Ligon. He was trying to climb that, which was also the defense rating of the goblins. So with um, Elena, she's been blessed from the gods, right? And she has this divine aura basically around her currently helping her. So I'm going to reduce the difficulty rating to a 12 so she gets a plus two to her agility. Let's go and see how this works out. An 18, doesn't even need the bonus. So she's able to navigate the embankment pretty quickly without much hesitation and grabs the first goblin here and whoo, tosses him down the side of the embankment towards the rolled ball bearings. Greased ball bearings, I'm sorry. And we'll set her up here. Bam. Which will put her close for, for the next round right there. Now, the goblin goes bouncing down the side of the embankment. Hits the area down here. And I'm going to be able to roll a save. See if the goblin saves himself or not. So that's going to be a 12. He's going to have to roll a 12 straight out. No bonuses and see if he gets it. He rolls a 20. Holy crap. So, yeah. He goes bouncing down the side of the embankment. He hits the ground. And he scurries up quickly onto his feet. And begins navigating up the side of the uh, embankment again. Flanking her. This is going to be... This is going to be wild. That's what this is going to be. Okay. Now... Lagging Court's turn, um, he sees what's going on right here, and he's stuck in between a rock and a hard place. He's got a sorcerer on his back that he's trying to hold up. He can't draw a weapon, and he has nothing, I, I mean, to do. The only recourse he has at this point is I could try to do an agility attack on him, and see if I could kick him further off into here. And, um, yeah, see if he rolls down into the pit of acid. So what, I, I'm going to try that. And Ligon, with his best efforts, he's going to get a plus two from his agility for this. He rolls a 16. Okay, he's able to do it. So he, he moves over to where the goblin is beginning to scale back up the side of this embankment. And he is able to get a foot out there and trip the damn thing as it's moving through. And it rolls back down the embankment, back out into the greased ball bearings. And everybody falls down and dies. Okay. So actually, I think at this point, I'm just going to um, place these guys here, here, and here. Boom. To make this easier, we all know they're up here in the embankment right here. And the ball bearings are rolling down this way. Um, so, he's been kicked out, tripped, rolled out into the middle of the ball bearings. Uh, let's do another save. He has to have a 12 or better. He rolls an 11. He is unsuccessful. 
and he goes down five feet. Mm. Okay. Now, with that being said, uh, it's going to go over to the goblins now. And this goblin is going to attack Elena. It's got to have a Elena's defense rating is a 14. 18. Um, yeah, the goblin does actually land an attack. Let's see how much damage it does. Two. Well, luckily for Elena, her leather uh, reduces damage by two. So she doesn't get wounded, but she sure as hell feels the attack. It hurt. All right. The second attack will come from this goblin. If you remember correctly, I hit him down here. So he has um, climbed the side of this embankment. <laughs> and sees what's going on and lunges to attack after Elena. 17, uh, yeah, and he hits. Luckily, once again, she does not take any damage, but she feels the, uh, <laughs> she definitely feels the pain of getting clopped upside the shoulders and the head with a damn club. <laughs> All right, so, Elena's turn, um, I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to have Elena, she's thrown one over, she grabs her dagger, pulls that out, and I'm going to see if she can make a slash at this guy that just climbed up over the embankment, because he's closest to the edge, and just like slash him and see if she can get him to fall off center and roll down the embankment out into the greased ball bearings. Let's see what happens here. So she's going to get a plus two. Um, wait a minute. No, plus one actually to her strength. Plus one. She gets plus one to her strength, which means they get a plus one for her uh, melee attack roll. All right. A four or five. No, she misses. It's not. Um, it's not noteworthy whatsoever. She just whew, a wide angle swing at the goblin. The goblin's still standing. So now it goes back to the D6 as to who goes first. The enemies or the PCs? The enemies do. So Elena made her swing. The goblin was able to evade that attack. Now he gets another attack on her. Ooh, rolls a one, a fumble. And then the fumble, with an attack, the weapon breaks or is lost. So as the goblin swings his club to try to, at last, finally end Elena, she is able to sidestep the attack. The club hits the rocky ground and the splintering sound of his club just going Psh! And him being weaponless, standing there looking at it like, let's see how he reacts to that. Let's see how he reacts to the fumble. <laughs> so the, the club splinters, the goblin is just standing there with this wild look on his face of like wonderment like whoa what just happened and all right now that ends that this goblin's turn oh rolls a five it is a mess okay so now goes back over to my characters oh forgot before it goes over to my characters we have this guy right here so he rolls, uh, he's got to roll a 12 for the save to be able to stop from rolling on the grease ball bearings. If he fails, he moves another five feet towards the acid pit. He rolls a 20, so he is able to get to his feet. And he sees, um, 
lag in court, hauling the sorcerer and trying to climb up onto the embankment to stay away from the greased marbles. I'm going to put him over in this area right here. So the goblin has got his footing and he's going to begin scurrying this way. He's got to save towards him. So next turn, he will be able to do that. Okay. Let's move on to Elena. Elena with her dagger drugged. Her dagger out drawn, I meant to say. I need a sip of coffee here. Okay. Elena with her dagger drawn. She is going to try another attack on... I forgot to move the sorcerer encounter token. Another attack on... Um, this goblin right here to see if she can knock him off balance and over the side of the embankment. She rolls an eight and she gets a plus one, which will bring it to nine. No, she is not successful any stretch of the imagination. And now it is court's turn, lying courts. And I'm going to see. If he has the strength to make it with him and a sorcerer up here to where this plateau would be right here on the terrain to be able to at least help or assist or do something um, to try to get away from the pit trap area down here. So his, we're going to say that's going to be pretty challenging. That's, I'm going to say a 16. Legging Court gets a plus three to his roll, and we're going to see what he does. A six plus three is a nine. No. So as he's, he, he just does not have the strength to be able to hold the sorcerer and climb with all his gear and everything else and up the side of this embankment to where he can hear the duel between Elena and these goblins ensuing. All right, now let's roll a d6 and see who goes first. A five, it'll be the PCs again. Okay. So, you know what I'm going to do? Elena is going to sheath her dagger, pull her crook out, and that'll be my turn for this round. That's all I'm going to be able to do with her. Because Dagger ain't working with these guys. And he has recently failed his save. He's unable to get up to this area. Um, I'm going to allow... I'm going to give him a prison presence save. I'm going to see if he is aware... Or if he notices, I should say... That this goblin has scurried to its feet and is quickly moving um, towards him to try to throw him back out into the grease ball bearings. So I'm going to say a 14 on that roll. And Ligon gets a plus two to his presence. Ooh, 17. No, he does not. Okay, so he's focused on, he's taking a breath. He's got the sorcerer up there. He's just winded. And unaware of what's getting ready uh, to happen to him. So now that it's the goblin's turn, he's going to advance five feet. And I'm going to roll his agility save. Um, actually, I'm going to say it would be an agility attack, actually, if he was to try to do a melee attack on him right now. See if he could possibly hit him with the club. We'll see. Let's see here. He rolls a six. He does horrible. So, yeah, Lagging Court is aware to his presence now. He hears the sound of rocks. <laughs> looks behind him. And he can see the uh, goblin starting to uh, ascend the rocky area while he's wildly swinging his club at him, just hoping to <laughs> injure some part of him. Okay. Um, with that out of the way, uh, we're going to go to these two goblins, and these are the last two to resolve for this turn. 
So this one goes to make an attack against um, Elena. And her defense rating is a 14. A 17, the goblin does hit. It's going to do 1d6 damage. Ooh, four points. Yowzer, so she's going to take two points of damage. So she will now have 19 of her 26 um, total health points so far from that attack. And the last attack we result is this goblin right here. That's a one. Ooh, a fumble. Ugh. So same thing as this goblin. He goes to swing at her misses, clubbing the ground, and his club shatters everywhere. Let's see how his reaction to this is. <laughs> Same way, he's just like astonished. He's just like, huh? Uh huh? Look at <laughs> what happened to the um the club. Okay. Now it will be the PC's turn. Um I think I'm gonna let Elena go first on this one. She uh has her crook now, she's equipped, she's ready to do an attack, and I'm going to see if I can take this one out right here is what I'm going to do. So she gets a plus one. 16. The defense rating number is a 14, so that hits. And the damage is going to be 2d4 plus one. So I know I got another d4 right here. Let's see what she... Ooh, a six plus one is a seven. Yeah, she does the uh, <laughs> she does the damage all right. So her crook just connects with the side of his skull. The crook uh connects with the side of the uh, the goblin skull. The goblin at that point rolls down the side of the embankment out into the uh t the the greased ball bearings rolling by and t t a big plume of um acid comes up from his body dissolving into this acid pit okay that was that one now lagan court what is he going to do there's not a whole lot he can really do. He can try one thing, one thing only, and that is he could try defending himself with his short bow. He's got the sorcerer over his shoulder and one arm tied up to hold him. He could try with his other hand at a penalty to see if he can strike and hit him. Let's do that. That's how I want to... Um, resolve that so now the target rating for the goblin will go to a 16 Ligon gets a plus three to his roll Ooh, he does it 14 15 16 so he hits it right on the money he does a backswing at the goblin and luckily connects and the short sword's going to do 1d4 plus three let's see what it does a four five six seven which is more than enough to kill the goblin so, boom, the sword connects on a lucky, a lucky hit, slashing the goblin's throat open, and it goes tumbling back down into the greased ball bearings and pff, moves about five feet down as it's trailing its black goblin blood towards the pit of acid. Okay. Now, we get down to the last goblin right here. Let's go for a morale roll. Let's see where his morale holds. He's just seen two of his comrades killed. One of them dissolved in a pit of acid. And his their morale is seven. So I got to roll a seven or better. Um, let's see what happens here. Well, okay. He did, uh, he did save. So he's going to hold his own. 
the goblin is actually going to hold his own and go to attack Elena. A one. Holy crap. <laughs> okay, let's see what the reaction is. Six. Oh, he is angered. So as he swings his club and it shatters, he's held with just the what's left of the handle, looking at it in his hand, screaming in a blind rage as he looks up at Elena. Oh, yeah. Now, let's... Uh, Roll the D6-er. Oh, not yet. I could. Uh, I think, you know what? I'm going to keep Lagging Court right where he's at. I'm going to skip over his turn. I'm going to let them rest for a moment. And I'm going to go back to the D6. I'm going to roll that. And I want to see who goes first in this turn. The Goblin or Elena. Okay, one through two. It's the Goblin. The goblin gets to go first. He doesn't have a weapon to hit her anymore, but I'm going to say he can do 1d2 points of physical damage with just his bare fists alone. So let's resolve that. Elena's, um, her armor offers her negative 2, um, or it absorbs 2 points of damage, well, so to speak, if she even needs it. Let's see. So the goblin has rolled a 19. He is able to bam, bam, connect and start punching on Elena. Now, let's roll a 1d6 for the damage or a d2 and see what we get. A 6. So it'll be doing two points. It, it doesn't get past her armor, but um, yeah, the goblin is just at this point just wailing on Elena in very close range. So... Okay, what is Elena going to do? What can Elena do at this point? Well, I could try an agility attack and see if I can possibly... He's right up on me, and he's attacking me and punching me and everything else. My crook isn't going to do me much good, but you know what? He could. She could definitely poof, kick him right off the embankment, and let's see if that works. Let's roll an agility attack, and let's see. So a plus two to that attack. Oh, inside the rolling tray here. A seven, eight, nine. No, she is unable to be able to do that. And the goblin is still attached, beating the hell out of her. So, whoo, boy, let's see what Ligon Court is going to do with all of this. Okay, I'm going to say Ligon Court finds an area where you can set the sorcerer down and he's not going to slide out into the greased ball bearings, which brings me to this guy right here. As he's getting the sorcerer settled in, he hears another huge curse splash of another goblin being dissolved into um, the acid pit. And he pulls himself to his feet, and, be, and I'm going to say he begins to climb up towards this area where Elena is at. And I'm going to do a, um, without the sorcerer, he's going to have a difficulty class 12 on a agility save to be able to pull this off. Let's see. A fourth. No, he's so tired. He starts to climb up there, and he's just like, bleh, bleh, trying to catch his breath. Now, this... We'll go back to Elena, where, yeah, Elena, Elena, Elena. So, the goblin, I'm just going to roll a, um, a d6. I'm going to see how much more, it's not going to be able to get through her armor, so I'm just going to see how much more damage it does this turn. Um... Okay, one through three, one point. She doesn't even feel that attack through the armor. I'm going to give Elena the chance again to see if she can do another agility attack. Or she could try to do a strength attack. Let's see if that works. I'm going to use a strength attack. See if we can just grab the goblin and throw him off of me. 
and I'll see how many feet he can be thrown. We'll, I'll figure out how we're going to figure that in. Okay. A five. Yeah, it doesn't work. So she's just grappling and struggling with this goblin that's beating the hell out of her. He's winded on the side of this little embankment trying to get up there. And let's roll a d6 to see who goes first in this complete mess. <laughs> Two. The goblin does. So I'm going to roll a d6 again just for amusement. Okay. So she, can't, she does feel them punches this time. He's really just... The beating the hell out of her. I don't know what more to say. Um, I'm going to have... I'm going to see if Ligon can do the save at this point. So he's got an agility plus two bonus. A five. Nope, he's still winded. He's still hanging out. Now let's get back to Elena. Let's see what she's able to pull off. This is going to be... I'm just going to do a straight up... Her strength is plus one. Her agility is plus two. Way better odds there i'm gonna see if she can toss him again off the embankment a 20 oh yeah oh yeah so <clears throat> not only does she is she able to toss him off of her but this goblin flies hits the rocks and bounces over to the edge of the um, embankment. She's got her dagger still equipped where she just walks up and thrusts the dagger down towards him with a free attack. That's what's cool. So with um, the attack, a plus two damage enemy armor reduced one tier. We can see that, but this was an agility attack, and um, not yeah, not only was she able to throw him, but because it was a critical, it was a critical attack, and she's got you got to remember this divine aura about her because she had prayed to her god and her god had answered, gifted her the life of this man to change the weaves of fate, but she had to pay that back somehow. <laughs> we have not got to that yet where Elena swings her dagger and screams out um, the basculus, if you will, in this the game theme it gives you, the oracle, out to her deity in her name as the payment for the life spared and the life given. Let's see how, how much damage this does while this... Goblin is on its way out. So it's 1d4 plus 1 damage. Let's resolve that first. So two points. Um, the Goblin feels the thrust of the dagger. And it's ugh, surprised as it's tossed off the embankment. As it bounces down the embankment. It'll still have four hit points left. Which is more than, a life, more than enough for it to do a save roll. But it's too close to really save itself, so we'll see. It winds up here, moving five feet there. We'll deal with that here in a moment. All right. So, Elena, she's going to have, well, an area, a moment of be able to catch her breath and be like, <sighs> and walks over towards the edge of the embankment and reassures Ligon Court that, you know, there's no more danger. Just sit, catch your breath, drink some water, and we'll deal with, um, deal with healing him as soon as we know the coast is clear. While she's doing this, I'm going to roll a, a save die for that goblin. It's fair is only fair. It's going to be a 12. A 7. It does not make it. The goblin, as it's sitting there scurrying, reaching at the wound it just received, and it's black goblin blood pouring out the wound from its back, it um, helplessly 
rolls right off into the acid pit. Its scream can be heard, this blood curdling scream, knowing it's getting ready to be dissolved in acid and there's nothing they can do to the sound of whoosh, of it being dissolved. And finally, last but not least, she is going to perform a healing spell on the sorcerer. And let's see how this goes. The... The Grace of the Dead Saint could be for 2D creatures, 2D2 creatures that can regain D10 HP. So, first and foremost, let's see how many creatures the spell is going to affect. Total of one. My target will be the Sorcerer. She has to have 12 or better. Her presence is a plus three. 14 so she is able to heal 10 hit points of damage onto the sorcerer where this is where my adventure is going to end off right here how i like to end my sessions off on a cliffhanger which is the fact that they have finally found this area they're not totally sure if it's 100 percent safe but they have cover they know nothing's coming through back here their way because this has all been sealed off and they can wait the trap out and explore their surroundings after they have all gotten some rest. All right, my friends, this is where we're going to leave the video off. This is where my game session is going to end off and I am going to um, pick up on this maybe at another time, maybe do another uh, playthrough session. You know, you guys let me know. Let me know if you want to see more. Um, and if not, then I will move on to other things. Move on to some terrain building, terrain painting, stuff like that. All right, my friends. Uh, hope you enjoyed the video. If you do, let me know. Drop me a comment. Give me a like. Um, don't forget to subscribe if you're new. And with that being said, this is Artichoke Dip. Signing off.